The vast realm of our world and its continent is filled with a plethora of creatures that seem to defy explanation. From the echoing roars of wolves who were once men to the haunting melodies of sirens, these beings intertwine myth with reality and often blur the lines between the two. But to truly understand the nature of these creatures, one must delve deep into their biology, anatomy, and ethology. In this second part of our journey together, we will attempt to unravel the scientific mysteries of just a few more of these creatures, a work that, for myself, has been decades in the making. Join me as we travel across the continent and seek to pull these creatures out from the shadowy depths of folklore and into the scrutinizing light of science. In the mist-covered forests and the desolate stretches of the northern realms, on nights when the moon glows brightest, villagers have long reported chilling howls that pierce the silence. Understandably, many locals would prefer that the source of these cries remain a mystery, but encounters with the creatures are becoming more frequent, hinting at their increasing proximity to human settlements. Yet the true mystery here is this creature's ability to transition between human and beast. Intriguingly, my studies indicate an intricate endocrine system that releases transformative hormones in response to specific lunar phases. As part of this transformation, the entire body undergoes a massive and largely unprecedented restructuring, forming the unfortunate victim of the lichen curse into something unrecognizable. And all across the continent, the tension between these creatures and local villagers continues to grow. Locals often need to enlist the services of a witcher, and in the case of certain monsters, even military forces struggle to overcome them. In another realm, similar battles take place, but not with sword or claw, nor are they limited to the ground. In that realm, intense battles between gargantuan machines dominate the land, seas, and even the skies. And now you too can experience the heart-pounding thrill of these battles with War Thunder, an epic free-to-play military action game available on PC, Xbox, PlayStation, and even Mac that pits an entire century's worth of land, sea, and air vehicles against each other. The latest La Royale update has literally changed the game, adding an entire French fleet with powerful battleships like the Paris, the legendary BTR-80, and Su-39 among many more. And the visual effects? They're stunning. Tanks explode, parts fly everywhere, naval ships shatter dramatically, and aircraft can be torn apart mid-air with bullets in real time. And for you history buffs, War Thunder has a plethora of unique vehicles from well-known to prototypes and spanning the 20th century even to the modern day. Dive into combat with vehicles from 10 powerhouse nations, customize, upgrade, and enhance every vehicle from its armor to its crew. And if you've ever taken a break from War Thunder, now's the time to return. The game is always adding new features and effects, and there's always something new. Don't wait, click the link in the description and download War Thunder for free. And for new and returning players who haven't played for 6 months or more, it gives it's even better. You'll get 100,000 silver lions, a week of German ground vehicle rentals, three premium vehicles forever, XP boosters, a premium account for a week, and more. Get all of these by clicking that link in the description, but act fast, the season of German gifts is winding down. Download War Thunder today. Now we'll return to our own realm, where encounters of another variety seem to lurk around every corner. In many ways, the werewolf is a biological paradox, a blend of human intellect and animalistic instincts. When standing tall, its physique dwarfs the average man. In fact, a werewolf on its hind legs can peer into the upper windows of most village homes. In its wolf-like state, the werewolf displays greatly hypertrophied musculature and deadly claws on both hands and feet, making it a truly formidable predator. Its fur, which covers its body in a kind of extreme hypertrichosis, ranges in color from gray to deep browns, and serves not only to shield it from the elements, but also as a natural camouflage within its wooded territories. The wolf-like head, complete with eyes that pierce low-light conditions with ease, is a hallmark of the werewolf's appearance. During the werewolf's transformation, in the cranial region, the frontal and parietal bones expand, while the zygomatic arches become more pronounced, resulting in a mesocephalic, canid-shaped head. The mandible lengthens and strengthens, accommodating larger and sharper teeth specifically designed for predation. The limbs, particularly the humerus and femur, also elongate, providing the werewolf with increased reach and stride. This adaptation offers explosive speed crucial for hunting. The phalanges become denser and terminate in sharp claws, 
becoming formidable weapons. Even the pelvis appears to tilt, shifting the creature's center of gravity and enabling both efficient bipedal and quadrupedal movement. Additionally, the werewolf's cardiovascular system is impressively efficient, with heart and lung capacity enlarged to support its heightened metabolic demands. The transformation process's rapidity could be due to the presence of specialized enzymes and proteins that swiftly remodel cellular structures. Unfortunately, in-depth study of this process is notoriously difficult and requires many more living specimens to understand fully. But of course, one of the most intriguing aspects of this transformation is its apparent connection to lunar cycles. While gravitational influence, or perhaps the arcane attributes of the moon's phases are debated, the full moon has been empirically noted as a prominent trigger. Remarkably, reverse transformation, returning to human form, is also possible. This process, however, seems to require a significant period of rest and the complete absence of lunar stimuli. The exact mechanism remains a mystery still, but it appears to involve the gradual suppression of transformative hormones, allowing human cellular structures to reassert themselves. It may go without saying, but while transformed, werewolves exhibit significantly increased aggression, likely caused by certain cerebral changes. The amygdala, responsible for emotional responses, exhibits heightened activity, while the prefrontal cortex associated with decision-making and impulse control undergoes suppressed functioning. This combination, paired with altered neurotransmitter levels, propels the beast into its characteristic rage. Yet anomalies do exist, and the case of Vincent Mays is particularly enlightening. Unlike typical werewolves, Vincent displayed an uncanny level of control over his transformative aggression. In-depth mapping of his brain showed advanced neuroplasticity. It could be that the harmony between his neurotransmitters, especially dopamine and serotonin, presented a deviation from the common werewolf prototype. Ultimately, the broader condition of therianthropy, the metamorphosis of humans into beasts, is believed to have roots in the chaotic event known as the conjunction of the spheres. As previously described, this cataclysmic event introduced myriad supernatural entities and arcane afflictions into our realm, and many scholars postulate that therianthropy, of which lycanthropy is but a subset, was among these transposed phenomena. Thus, werewolves might be a vestige of another world entirely, now inextricably linked to ours. Now, let us move to the rocky coastlines of Skellige, where an amalgamation of a different sort threatens from beneath the waves and the sky. Along the coastlines and out to sea, sailors often speak of hypnotic songs that pierce the gentle rhythm of the waves, a call that many find irresistible. For many an unfortunate sailor, following this call leads to a gruesome death at the claws of what is known as the siren. A study of the anatomy and physiology of these creatures reveals an organism perfectly adapted for a life between the deep sea and the open skies. From a structural standpoint, sirens exhibit a unique blend of humanoid, avian, and piscine characteristics, and this is most apparent in their skeletal configuration. The clavicles are reminiscent of those found in humans, but are fused into a structure known as a furcula, or wishbone, something like those of birds, providing added strength and flexibility for flight dynamics. Their vertebrae, especially the cervicals, are elongated in comparison to other humanoids, granting them a heightened range of neck motion. The sirens diverge greatly from traditional winged creatures, possessing wings that originate near the pelvic region. This arrangement comes with its own set of skeletal modifications. For example, the siren's pelvic bones are more robust and possess extended processes for much more numerous muscle attachments. The wings themselves are supported by arm-like skeletal structures comprised of three primary digits. Two of these digits protrude outward, acting as claw-like structures for defense, grappling, and even aiding in prey capture. The third digit, broader and elongated, provides the main structural support for the outer wing membrane. The membrane itself is thin and fin-like, and composed of collagen and elastin fibers. This appears to provide an impressive balance between flexibility and tensile strength, and facilitates efficient flapping during flight and effective streamlining for underwater gliding. But arguably the most dangerous aspect of the siren's abilities is its alluring call. And indeed, the siren's vocal cords are a marvel of biological engineering. They exhibit a dual-layered structure. The outer layer, thick and robust, produces the deeper, melodic tones that have been the subject of many a sailor's tale. In contrast, the inner layer, finer and more tensile, can emit a piercing range of sounds, likely used for communication and perhaps even echolocation. 
There is also a certain shape-shifting aspect to the nature of sirens, appearing as beauties one moment and beasts the next, that remains a mystery. Some hypothesize a rapid skin morphing controlled by specialized dermal muscles that may allow for swift changes in skin texture and coloration. In any case, upon their demise, their monstrous facade seems to fall away, revealing an innately human-like form, possibly a biological default. The siren's evolutionary journey, while still a subject of scholarly debate, is an undeniably intricate blend of adaptation and survival. Indeed, they are a fantastic example of nature's astounding capacity for innovation. Along our journey, we may be fortunate enough, or perhaps unfortunate enough, to encounter an exclusively land-based creature, though apart from a biological standpoint, it is far less beautiful. On the dense borders of forests and the shadowy thickets of the swamps, among the locals there is a creature spoken of in hushed tones, the embodiment of tales mothers use to caution their young. Alarmingly, recent times have seen the fiend drawn from its hiding spots, venturing into inhabited territories. At first observation, the fiend appears to be a bizarre amalgamation of bovine and cervid characteristics, standing taller than three grown men combined. Its robust frame is supported by four pillar-like legs, each terminating in cloven, hoof-like appendages that leave a distinct mark on the ground they tread. Its most striking feature, especially at a distance, is likely its broad pair of antlers. These antlers, while certainly serving an ornamental function in sexual displays, also serve as tools of intraspecies combat and defense against potential threats. The fiend's hide is a thick, bristled coat of russet and brown. Beneath this coat ripples dense muscle, especially in the neck, where the weight of the head and antlers must be well supported. A pronounced nuchal crest in the occipital region of the skull serves as the attachment point for many of these enlarged muscles. As evidenced by its buried dentition, which exhibits both sharp canines and incisors alongside broad molars, the fiend is omnivorous, though this certainly makes it no less deadly to humans. Enlarged mandibular muscles give the fiend an incredible bite force, and a well-developed olfactory system makes successfully hiding from the fiend a near impossibility. But by far, the fiend's most mystifying feature is a third eye, located centrally on its forehead and housed in a specialized socket just as with the other two eyes which are located more laterally. Historical accounts and local tales often emphasize this eye's hypnotic capability, rendering seasoned warriors motionless or sending them fleeing in inexplicable terror. My own dissections and studies have shown that this organ is not just a passive, luminescent tissue. It is a highly specialized tool that has evolved over millennia, fine-tuned for hunting and defense. Indeed, within the fiend's third eye lies a concentration of specialized cells containing luciferin, a biological light-emitting compound. When this molecule reacts with oxygen in a process catalyzed by the enzyme luciferase, it produces an intense, dynamic, and pulsating glow. Rapid fluctuations in brightness and rhythmic pulsations stimulate specific neural pathways in many creatures' visual systems, causing a sensory overload. This overwhelming stimulation creates temporary disorientation, but even more than that, there's evidence to suggest that the light interacts with certain neurotransmitters in the observer's brain. Preliminary studies on effective creatures post-exposure to the fiend's third eye indicate elevated levels of gamma aminobutyric acid, a chief inhibitory neurotransmitter. This results in the suppression of neural activities, leading to reduced alertness and even temporary paralysis. In truth, the fiend's third eye is a biological marvel, though the nature of its paralyzing effect has made in-field study remarkably difficult. I caution any who wish to study these fascinating creatures to do so only with the accompaniment of a witcher whose physiology allows them to, at least in part, withstand these effects. But while the approach of a fiend is hard to mistake, our next creature is a master of blending in, not only with its environment, but even among humans. Mysterious beings of the night, vampires are both revered and feared across the continent. They are a complex branch of creatures whose evolutionary origins remain somewhat shrouded in mystery. The varied subtypes of vampires indicate a rich evolutionary history, characterized by adaptive radiations in response to environmental and ecological pressures. It should be noted that vampires are not the result of a transformation from one species, such as a human, into a different form. They are entirely unique organisms, and their lineages did not originate here. Indeed, as with so many creatures, they arrived only after the conjunction. Of course, central to vampire physiology is the necessity for blood. This hematophagous behavior isn't merely a predatory instinct, but in most cases, a physiological requirement. 
Rich in nutrients like iron, proteins, and various minerals, blood does offer a compact source of sustenance. As a result, the vampire digestive system has specialized enzymes and processes tailored to extract maximum nourishment from ingested blood, simultaneously filtering and neutralizing potential toxins. In general, vampires exhibit a host of advanced physiological traits that set them apart from other humanoid species. Their cardiovascular and muscular systems are hyper-efficient, granting them enhanced strength, speed, and endurance. Additionally, heightened sensory systems offer numerous advantages in hunting and navigation. But perhaps one of the most astounding features of the vampire physiology is their near-immortal longevity. In short, it appears that the telomeres of their DNA exhibit persistent regeneration. This continuous relengthening prevents the cellular aging process, likely granting them their legendary lifespan. Their regenerative capacities also extend to wounds, allowing them to recover from injuries that would be fatal to other species. This latter ability appears to be due to a combination of several factors. First is the abundance of multipotent circulating stem cells, which rapidly migrate to the site of an injury and differentiate into any required cell type, providing extremely rapid healing. Then there is their extraordinarily high metabolic rate, which facilitates rapid cell growth and division, each of which are essential for tissue repair. This also explains their ravenous need for blood and flesh, essentially needed in order to refuel. Finally, I have observed a denser network of capillaries and larger main vessels. This augmented delivery system ensures a rapid supply of nutrients, oxygen, and essential growth factors to any injury site. Interestingly, the reddish hue of many species' eyes are likely a direct result of this enhanced vascular network. Beyond their physical abilities, vampires display a spectrum of behaviors, often suggesting a depth of intelligence and social organization. Some species exhibit complex social hierarchies, intricate communication patterns, and even a semblance of culture. Contrarily, species like Garcanes and Echimaras, while less socially evolved, showcase advanced hunting strategies and territorial behaviors. For the purposes of clarity, as a whole, vampires are usually categorized as higher or lesser, often based on their perceived level of intelligence. Higher vampire species include, among others, the Bruxa, Alp, and true higher vampires. The Bruxa is a particularly enigmatic and deadly species, commonly mistaken for young human women in their humanoid form, though their true form is that of a large, vicious bat. Beneath their beautiful facade lies an array of specialized adaptations, retractable fangs optimized for bloodletting, and an unmatched sonic cry that ranges from a disorienting scream to haunting songs in the ancient vampire language. The former ability can even be lethal, as the sonic force of their scream, the result of a highly specialized larynx and vocal apparatus, can disrupt neural function and cause direct physical damage to their victims. Worse, in hunting, Bruxy often toy with their prey, using sensory deprivation as a cruel hunting tactic. And though you may think yourself safe in daylight, while these creatures favor the shroud of night, they tolerate sunlight quite well. But while the Bruxa displays intelligence, genuine higher vampires are a separate, extremely powerful breed, with great abilities that are sometimes unique to particular specimens. And unlike other species, true higher vampires are seldom observed in an animalistic form. In fact, most frequently, they are indistinguishable from humans. Unlike humans, however, higher vampires possess strength, speed, and reflexes far superior. Like other vampire species, such traits can likely be attributed to densely packed muscle fibers and augmented neural transmission speeds. In truth, higher vampires exhibit several perplexing characteristics that challenge our understanding of biology and physics, and given their rarity and reluctance to submit themselves to study, data is sparse to say the least. For instance, their reflection is invisible in a mirror, and their bodies cast no shadow in sunlight. This may result from a unique molecular structure or inherent property that refracts or deflects light in unconventional ways and may also account for their apparent ability to become invisible. But once more, these hypotheses have not been proven. What is readily observed is that among all the vampire species, true higher vampires display some of the most impressive abilities to regenerate. Regrowth from even severe injuries such as beheading or incineration suggests an even more elevated level of circulating stem cells than their lesser counterparts, though I cannot rule out a unique cellular mechanism that facilitates extensive tissue reconstruction over vastly prolonged periods. Additionally, their ability to transform into other forms, such as massive bats, implies an extensive cellular plasticity, allowing rapid reorganization of body structures. 
Finally, unlike other vampires, true higher vampires do not need to consume blood to survive. However, blood consumption can apparently enhance their powers, making them even more formidable. This suggests a highly evolved metabolic system that can derive energy from both traditional food sources and hemoglobin. But while the higher vampires seem to represent the pinnacle of vampire evolution, those of the lesser variety are no less fascinating. As previously mentioned, there are multiple lesser vampire species, such as the Ekimara, Garcane, and Fletter. Let's take for example the Fletter, savage creatures of the night whose very appearance embodies the fearsome tales told of them. Though they possess a humanoid form, Fletters are easily distinguishable by their bat-like wings, large horns, and fierce fangs. Their skeletal structure, especially the winged appendages, appear to have evolved from modified arm bones much like bats. This modification gives them the ability to glide and sometimes even achieve sustained flight for brief periods. The pronounced muscles around the shoulders and upper back, specifically the deltoids and trapezius, are significantly hypertrophied in flutters as compared to humans and facilitate the necessary force and endurance to move their bat-like wings with sufficient power for takeoff, semi-sustained flight, and rapid maneuverability. Additionally, I have observed that the keratinous growths that form their large horns are denser than that of typical mammalian horn structures, potentially serving as both defensive and mating display mechanisms. Their eyes, typically said to glow with an eerie luminescence, have a higher concentration of rod cells and, in similar form to other vampire species, allow them to capture even the faintest light in near-complete darkness. This, combined with a tapetum lucidum, a layer of tissue that reflects visible light back through the retina, not only enhances their night vision, but also makes them appear to glow in certain lighting conditions. But while higher vampires blend into human society and can often remain undetected indefinitely, like other lesser vampires, flutters make no such pretenses. Their primal nature and monstrous visage ensure that their presence is always noted. Indeed, they simply do not possess the intellectual depth nor the nuanced morality of the higher vampires. Instead, they operate on a more primal neural circuitry, almost entirely on instinct and hunger. In some ways, this makes them more predictably violent, as they lack the internal conflicts or deeper considerations of their advanced relatives. This world is truly teeming with creatures that are at once beautiful and disturbing, and there are many, many more to investigate further. For now, we must rest from our studies, but rest assured that there is always something new to discover, if you're willing to seek it out. I simply hope, for your sake, that it doesn't seek you out first. Until next time, thanks for watching, and remember, you matter.